And um, today, uh, Todd, you didn't see, but I did a little circle around. You guys can get in the okay, get in the scene if you want to. Well, you don't have to. Yeah, you're probably talking. I've got I got Tyler here. Rachel's right there, and Penny's right there, and we're all sitting around the computer in a circle, which does you very little good to know that we're all in a circle. But we feel good because I get to see all these lovely faces <laughs> in addition to yours. Um, and yeah, there's so much that we could talk about today. Welcome, Dan. Nice to see you. Hi. Um, and one of the things that I was noticing around, around what's happening is I'm just paying attention to the different ways that people are activated. You know, in the fundraising world, there are all these things about how to um, verify a potential funder, meaning they actually align with what you're doing, they care about it, and they have the money to donate, and those sorts of things that people do. And I actually find most of that pretty disgusting. Not because it's ineffective, but because I just don't like being transactional. And so I've been noticing how have people actually been showing up and getting money? And of course, we've done crowdfunding where people have given $5 up to $1,000. We have people who are in the pledge community who are contributing more significantly. We have people like Todd who showed up helping me connect into some of the crypto world, setting me up on Giveth and arranging for other people to donate money as well as him donating money. We have Tyler right now is, has just prepared a, a Gitcoin grant that I'm gonna set up and submit today and then also post on Giveth. And so like we have, and I'd say Tyler, who's also contributed to the, to the pledge community is stepping forward with fundraising in this interesting way. Because I think because of your interest in this, this decentralized way of funding and how the algorithms, for those of you who don't know, Gitcoin has a, a computational algorithm that allows you to recruit more resources by being successful at getting your friends to engage. Yeah, I can explain more of that at some point. Um, and so yeah, I think he's as much interested in nerding out on the algorithm <laughs> as being effective at fundraising, but that's part of why I think these this diversity of ways people show up with money is so interesting. And then I look at how Dan showed up into the work with Las Albercas, how many of you may not know that it was Stephen who showed up to help us fund the Centropic Agroforestry and how another member of the pledge community who's still, I haven't gotten permission to say who it is, that's putting forward forth $9,000 to support the children's theater to complete construction, which is something that happened this week. And I'm just noticing how does this actually happen? Not how do we su be successful at raising money, but almost like be an anthropologist for a moment. What's actually going on here? And you'll see in every case, there's a level of intimacy in people's connection to what's going on. It's like a, it's a quality of relating. And so it got me thinking that a way we could use this meeting today is actually to run it almost like a little workshop or a class uh, where we would practice building relationships in a way that could help to raise money, but we don't actually do it to raise money. We do it for a deeper purpose than that. And that is that I found the key to all of this fundraising is anchored to one person, of course, which is me, because I've been the one who's gathered and aggregated different people. And then they started relating to each other in different ways. And I've been able to help carry the story forward. And the anchor of it all, the sort of like the secret sauce for the fundraising part has been how I tell my personal story. And then how other people feel called to live into their personal story and how that's opened up all kinds of pathways of relationship. And so I think each of you being here has a valuable piece of data in the story you have about how you came to be into, in contact with me, how you came into contact with Earth Regenerators, how you came into contact with a space where you went from following along to taking action. And what I'm seeing in all of this that's really powerful is how we tell our own stories. So it's not how does Joe tell his story. It's just because I'm related to all of you, I can see how I relate to you in a story form because I relate to each of you differently. Um, so I can look out into the world and see my story is expressed differently with Dan than it is with Todd, than it is with Paula, than it is with Lisa. So I see my story as multifaceted because my story plays out in personal relationships with different people. And so what I'm, what I'm really feeling into is how do we all become better storytellers 
so that we build the kinds of relationships we need for this work. And that creates a context in which fundraising will naturally happen. But we actually, if we did it for the sake of fundraising, I think it wouldn't work. Now, if we did it transactionally, transactionally to achieve that outcome, it wouldn't be authentic. Um, because you probably don't actually care about someone else giving money to Barichara. But you do care about something happening in Barichara or someone being involved in it. There, I think there are real emotional motivations and connections in the quality of our relationships. And that money flows with as a byproduct, if it flows at all, and if it's needed. And it's amazing how often money is not needed when you have friends. Like I have not hired a moving service ever in my life, but I have bought plenty of beer and pizza for people to move me when I'm moving from one house <laughs> to another. And no money exchanged hands between my friends. And so um, I've, I've become really skilled at creating context where my friends feel good about helping me um, without being manipulative. And it's partly because I help them. Like, man, Joe carried all those heavy boxes three stories up into an apartment. I'm gonna help him put boxes into a moving truck. And so it's really, there's this quality of relationship that matters. And what I sense is with the Vivero for Earth Regenerators, with what we're doing in Barichara with the Pledge community, with all the things that are emerging around the Refi Barichara event and the ways that diverse networks of collaboration are arising with people like Seb Nightingale and Ecolab, with Paul from Ecostake, with Antonio and all of his work. You know, Antonio and I are like the co-creators co of this event. Do you know how this started was Antonio offered to help me set up my first crypto wallet in December. And he's like, Joe, if you need to know how to set up a crypto wallet, let's set up a Kepler wallet to show you how it works. And then he gave me money while he was helping me so I could use the wallet. And then from there, he saw how I was doing things and he had this idea about planting an event in Barichara as he followed more closely. And now we're co-creating this big event. And so there are lots of ways that these relationships are actually the primary engine of change and, and the driver of change. And so what I thought would be really powerful for us to do today is to move from the spectator theater frame to the Blue Man Group street theater frame. <laughs> For those of you who know what I'm talking about. And basically, spectator theater is like when you sit in the audience in a seat and there's a stage and there's like, you know, a curtain that comes down and there's a separation between the audience and the performance. And then street theater, which includes most of hip hop and all kinds of really powerful art genres, is participatory and co-creative. And, uh, and you break down, sometimes it's called breaking down the fourth wall, which is that the wall that separates the performers from the participants is broken down. And what I've noticed is that there is a tendency in Earth Regenerators for there to be a theatrical spectacle of everyone watching me raise money. This happened with the Bari Chara Working Group. This happened with the setting up of the ER Fund. <laughs> Now, but notice that what I'm saying is actually not true because all of you have stepped forward in a different way. Because you could say that I successfully got you to give money and that would be true and misleading because what's actually happened is we've stepped into a space of collaboration. And that means all of our stories have changed, but we may not have consciously updated this. And so what I'm sensing is if we have a way to practice telling our own stories, to ourselves, to our friends, to others who may be interested in what we're doing, that that's actually the very best way to do fundraising. But it would achieve so much more than this. Like, for example, if we want to have a lot of active engagement in Earth Regenerators, who are the people that you would want in Earth Regenerators who aren't there now? Or if you're in another space, like Paul, I'm looking at you, how you're involved in R3.0 and other groups. Are there people in those groups that should be collaborating around what we're doing in Barichar right now or with what's happening with Regenerators? And the question is, if there's someone that comes to mind, what story would you tell them, a true story, what story would you tell them that might actually engage them in an authentic way to participate in what we're doing? And I think this is the real question for, for catalyzing the entire regenerative movement is how we learn how to tell our own stories or just live our own stories in a way 
that invites collaboration, that invites participation. And so um, I would say this is very different. Like I remember when we had a conversation with Jonathan and Victoria where they said, we have friends. David Rose was someone who came up in that conversation. So I use David as a, as a placeholder for other people. They both know a lot of people that could be funders of what we're doing, but is asking them to fund us the right question? Is that the right relationship? Is that the right story? Or should they perhaps be doing something else? And so, so this invitation to tell our story is really like, I could ask, how did Rachel come to Bar HR the first time and why did she come back? And what is your story? And what is your story that related to me? But then later you have your own story, right? And how did that work? And so I thought what might be nice on the call today is because we're all friends here, we could actually practice telling our stories to each other. And then, and I think this will actually be deeply inspiring to, to hear each other's stories and to tell our own stories to each other because this is a safe place. And then the homework challenge, the bonus points, the gold star in your homework would be to tell your story to someone in the next week. And I think this is gonna be really powerful because it'll move all of us into action. And the way I would invite this as an activity today is you can tell your story in, in one of two ways. You can tell your story about how you came into contact with the work in Barichara, which is what does it mean to you? Why are you participating? How is it changing your life? Why are you here? What makes you excited or motivated to be a part of this? But then you could do exactly the same exercise for Earth Regenerators if you wanted to. So it's like your choice. You, you could tell the story like Todd has, has said and the last time we talked to him, you said, Todd, that joining Earth Regenerators has really changed your life. And in the last several months, it's been the meeting, the Friday meeting has been sort of a highlight of your week. The way you told us that story is a story you could tell others to get them to come to Earth Regenerators. But notice you're getting them to come for a good reason. We're not just recruiting people to grow the numbers or like forget all those bullshit metrics. Actually forget all metrics, but do think in terms of strategy. We wanna build a dynamic and powerful community. And so a dynamic and powerful community is us with people we relate to well, doing things together. And so that's why I think this exercise of telling our story is something I'd like to see spread across Earth Regenerators, but I'd love to practice it here this morning. And both Rachel and Todd who have been working on the Vivero concept, which originated with Rachel in the Beale Parky, if I recall correctly. Um, <laughs> uh, so she had the initial idea. It's like, how could the Vivero, for those of you who don't know, Vivero is basically um, uh, is recurring monthly donations in a membership sort of uh, format for Earth Regenerators to create a pool of money to go into the ER fund and, sir, and sir, support Earth Regenerators. And so the qu key question is, how would we recruit, recruit Earth Regenerators members to join the Vivero, to become monthly donors? And so what would that story be? And notice what would the story be is not singular. It's what would your story be to this person? What would your story be to that person? What are the personal relationships? And that's, this is the secret of fundraising, by the way. Rachel could talk all about it. We were chatting over coffee in the kitchen this morning about it, about how doing fundraising is mostly, it doesn't look like fundraising. It's mostly just building relationships with people. And that's because that's the secret to fundraising. We could ask like, why did Brian and Susan step forward to fund uh, this education work in Barichara? Well, because even though we hadn't met, we had a relationship forming. What was the story of that relationship on Twitter? So. I think I probably bludgeoned the point enough <laughs> um, by just giving lots of examples. But I'd love to invite us to just spend our time today exploring our own stories. And what's amazing about this is that one of the most powerful therapeutic frameworks of the 20th century was called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's actually not the most powerful anymore. There, people have found problems with it and they've improved upon it. But in shorthand, all that cognitive behavioral therapy is, is you have some recurring behaviors that you don't like. You have some story about yourself that causes you to keep engaging in those behaviors. And the therapist, which anyone can fill this role, they just listen to your story and ask you questions about the story. 
and then you come to see the story isn't actually serving your needs and that there's another story you'd rather tell that's actually true that changes who you are. And that's how cognitive behavioral therapy works is you start to systematically explore the weaknesses in your own story because parts of your story are based in past traumas and coping mechanisms to deal with hardship and you gradually change your story. So practicing telling your story is an extremely powerful way to heal yourself, which is what cognitive behavioral therapy said. So in that sense, telling our story today is an opportunity to find something beautiful in ourselves and give it to someone we love. If someone in this group that we have love for, you can give love to that person by telling your story in a way that brings out something beautiful as a gift to them. I was inspired by this, you might be too. I got insight from this, you might too. I was helped during a time of difficulty and hardship and maybe this will work for you. You bring a gift in your story. That's what my book is about. My book is wait, wait, say, say more about this, Rachel. Okay, so, so, so I just recently published a book and it is my story of becoming an earth regenerator. So, I mean, it, and, and now that it's out into the world, as of yesterday, um, it, it will, um, any of the profits, any, you know, assuming people will buy copies, um, that uh, profits uh, will, will all go into the Earth Regenerator Fund because it's an Earth Regenerator story. So just to say that I think I took this concept maybe to the um, broadest interpretation and, uh, but it was a, you know, it was a story I found out I was telling over and over again through campfires and all of these things. And, it, and I was feeling, I was feeling myself being changed by the process of telling this story. And I felt that the relationships I was building around sharing it and having other people share their stories, because it's not just my story. There are other people's stories in the book. Um, some of you may recognize yourselves even. Um, <laughs> so just so you know. Um, <clears throat> But just to say that that was that's what this that's I think kind of the most um, maybe uh, extreme example of, of of how this can go that the telling of the story was changing me it was creating relationships it was changing other people and hopefully will encourage people to want to to have their own story and also looking for ways to make that be um, feeding the 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 liquidity of what of what we're doing because I mean at the end of the day. Anything that we're really going to want to do is going to require that we have resources. And so this is a way of, you know, I don't have a lot of money, but I have a little money. And he has a little money and he has a little money. And my little bit of money is not going to do anything. But if we put it all together, you know, it's, it's sort of a regenerative mutual fund, I guess you would say. <laughs> in a way. So anyway, that's, that's just how, how I was thinking about it. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. So this is why I thought it would actually be good for us to practice telling our story. And so what I think would be beautiful is in the next hour, if each of us just tells a story in, in three to five minutes, you know, it's like a, basically just um, share something about how Earth Regenerators has changed you or why you go there, or share something about why you step forward to support the work in Barichara and how it's affected you. And I think what may surprise you is the effect you'll have on everyone else. I remember, watch this, I wanna show you something. Okay. See how my arm can go around <laughs> the body of this beautiful woman? That's because she told her story in the Project Incubator. <laughs> so just saying, you it, never know where it's it going does to change happen. lives. It does change lives. <laughs> and so, um, so, uh, does it sound okay to everyone for our, our use of our time today? And does anyone feel like going first and telling their story, including anyone here who would like to tell their story? That's right, JP. I heard it as a recording when <laughs> Penny told her story. <laughs> um, is there anyone who would like to go first? Practice sharing our stories. I'll go first. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? Hey, look, I have to tell you, though, you know, this is like the hardest thing for me. Um, I've got, like, like I've mentioned, PTSD from some of my own experiences. And so s stepping into this role, and, I'm, and I've been thinking about this for a while, 
that um, first I've got to break it to my family that I'm doing this. They don't know my my siblings and my my mom. And um, you know, I've been thinking about how am I going to tell the story to them. And and then ongoing, I think that as part of you know making this effort, you know, move moving this effort forward, you know, I, I feel like I owe it to the effort to publish some kind of. I'm not sure if it'll be one video or one one YouTube posting or maybe a series, um, you know, as, as to how I, you know, get there because I've got to extract myself from here, even though I think Northern California probably, you know, needs its own, uh, you know, fund and, you know, collective effort because I think that's going to get real hot here and it's going to get pretty over the next couple of years, all the fires and then the drought, but I digress. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, I, I saw Joe struggle in Costa Rica. I saw some of the things that he had done before and kind of just watched from afar and I admired his ability to share his life openly because that's something I just don't do for a lot of reasons. And um, and I also began watching the Jem Bendel, you know, he put stuff out, you guys might know about deep adaptation. And so for a good long time, I was kind of stuck in a frustrated state. I had, um, you know, I have this property that I'm trying to sell, but there was an adjacent property, a plot that was also, it wasn't put up for sale. I, I thought it was going to be offered to me because it's the same people owned it that sold me my house. And uh, if I had known they were actively looking to sell that plot, I would have made overtures and scratched together the 50 or $60,000 would have needed to to buy it because I wanted to put corn and beans and start a school to teach permaculture um, techniques. Uh, I have a lot of space above on my in my house. I could have housed a little dormitory there for students. I had this great plan, but it got snatched out from under me and, and the, the developer put a big old house on it just before I knew what was happening, it was already bought. And so I felt really defeated by that. Just yet another thing that was kind of holding back my ability to move into some kind of meaningful um, uh, chapter of my la the last chapter of my life. So, you know, I decided after watching what's happening in Barichara for a good long time, uh, I was really inspired by Joe's story there. And I could see that this would, this would be a good thing to do. You know, I, I everywhere I turned here in Sacramento, and, and I know that this is not anecdotal, but it seems that the, Everybody around here is, you know, real maggot. I don't know if you know what that means. Uh, right, right wing. Uh, you know, we we're going to technology is going to save us. Uh, the the climate change is a big hoax. Um, you know, we just need to bear down and you know burn more oil. So, um, you know, I just couldn't find a foothold anywhere uh, of of, of like minded folks. So I thought, you know, this is a good idea. I'm going to make an impact. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna throw in my little money and and my life into this thing because I think that that's a community that can receive it. That you know we can do these things that we've been talking about in abstract, make them real. So that that's my story. You know that 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 that's how I got here. Was it was a, it was a struggle, just searching for a purposeful place and and effort. And now. Now that I've gotten into this thing, boy, it's harder than I thought it would be. I thought my house would sell in 30 days and uh, I'd, somebody would grab it up for a million bucks and uh, it didn't happen. Various things got in my way. Bad luck here, a little, you know, things went wrong there. And now here I am in September struggling to get this thing off, you know, I get, get out of here. But nothing worth doing is ever easy. So I know that. Um, and I look forward to the, my arrival there that you know, I can get my hands in the dirt, that I can start interacting with all the locals. And I really think that that's the powerful thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I wanna make this connection with what the puppas are doing in Canada with the children and, and having those links start to establish this uh, collaboration of teams uh, that we create this, I'll call it a flagship, if you will, in Barichara, but that that's just one place where we'll be doing this and that, that these kinds of, communities are going to congeal and begin to function in such a way all over the world. I really believe this. And, and I think that it's these kinds of relationships that we'll establish that are going to have that, that it's just going to happen. 
uh, I'm not just going to happen, but we have to put effort into it. But it's not just making Barichara a nice, you know, I'm going to call it a utopia for now, to just to give it a label. But um, but that these things can are going to happen, you know, can happen with our collaboration around the world. And I think that the, the children are a big part of that. It's not just that, but that's kind of the focus, at least for me at the beginning, is, is getting my hands in the dirt, getting the ecoversity off the ground, and then and then begin to work these um, collaborative relationships around the world with other teams. Anyway, that's my story. I'm going to pass it to whoever wants to go next. Yeah, the floor is open. Dan, thank you so much. Um, I'm really moved by your story. I have been the whole time. So um, thank you very much for sharing. Who would like to share next? The floor is open, including. We can go next if, if you like. Yes, please. It's, it's strange because there are a lot of echoes in our story with Dan's story in terms of wanting to get somewhere and feeling that frustration and not being able to find a community that you feel that, that you can be a part of and that has some meaning. We've been working on the seven generation work for a number of years. And the relationship with money has been interesting because we were, there were a lot of times when we needed money. There were a lot of times where we reached out for money. There were a lot of times when we needed a little bit of cash personally just to keep going. And asking for that money was hard and people we thought we could count on let us down. And when we did get money, we felt less than. Um, so it was a complicated relationship. So after all these years of working on the seven generation work, we finally got to a point where we got uh, a grant, a reasonable chunk of change that we could do something with. And that had two parts to it. Um, the first part was with that money came expectations. And those expectations start to pull you down into the existing system. And we didn't want to be pulled into doing the same old, same old, and not doing something that really showed a deep respect for life. I mean, the last few days, personally, I've been struggling with a lot of deep sadness that, that there isn't respect for life. One third of Pakistan is underwater and it might get 30 seconds on the news. And then locally here, you know, we do intergenerational work. We just took our five-year-old twin goddaughters for their school orientation. They're, they don't have a teacher assigned yet. The schools don't have enough teachers. And the sense of relationship, it, it was like bringing them into a factory, not into a place of relationship. And then at the other end with elders um, in our local area, They've taken frail elders in hospitals who they call bed blockers, who are taking up space, and they've put in a piece of legislation that against their will, those bed blockers can be moved to any long-term care home that has a space, even if it's hundreds of kilometers away. So we have no respect for the planet. We have no respect for the young. We have no respect for the old, and it breaks my heart. And so we look we started looking for a way to, to make sure that we came into the work we were doing here from an authentic and meaningful place. And we started looking at what other people were doing and there's a lot of interesting things that people are doing. And we started following Joe over several months um, and listening to his sessions and following some of his postings and feeling that this was the thing that to us was the most realistic, was the most meaningful, was the most authentic. And we were saying, okay, how do we come at our work from this bigger place? 
and with this global connection to the something like Joe is doing so that it has this bigger resonance. So there's not this feeling, okay, we're doing stuff locally and everybody feels good, but what does it really mean? <laughs> and then we saw the tweet from Joe where he was asking for the money for the children's fund. And for the first time in our life, we had some money that we could do something with, that we could help somebody. That was the first time we've ever had some extra dollars that we could do something with. And the sense that we could use that money and connect into what he's doing, like that, that brought me the biggest joy over the last few weeks. That's been one of the few things that has kept me going. Like we did this, we took this step, we did this and it makes sense. And it's, it's, it's full of life and it's, it's about people and it's about the vitality of life. And the last couple of weeks, we've been working on understanding more about Barry Char, trying to tell the story, trying to figure out a way to bridge between what we're doing here and, and Barry Chara. And like the, the fundraising thing that Joe posted, people aren't getting it. I mean, it was written for the refi space and it was written for refi Barry Chara and it's not working. And I've been struggling with, okay, how do I make the bridge? And the thing that I found has been most effective for us so far locally with the people that we're working with is I shared Tyler's story of, that he posted on, um, on Earth's Regenerators. And hi. Oh. <laughs> and, and that had the biggest, I'm going to cry, that had the biggest impact on people. We shared it with, like, we, we were trying to talk to the professor at the <laughs> local university that we were working with about what this was about. And it's like, I couldn't even get his attention until I shared Tyler's story. And then we're working with some university students, some grad students, and we couldn't get them to understand it until they read Tyler's story. And then we're working with a 17 year old high school student named Ethan. And Ethan, I think is a lot like Tyler. They're both sort of sensitive, thoughtful young men. Is he gonna come and join I, the King Party Chat? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, okay, I should make a connection. So I gave him the story. And so I have an invitation for Tyler we're having a, a Zoom meeting with Ethan on Monday. And if Tyler is available, it would be really nice for me to introduce Ethan and Tyler uh, on a Zoom meeting Monday to start weaving some personal connections between Barichara and the work here. Yeah. Um, jump on in, I was just finding the article. Yes, uh, I, oh, very yeah, real, that. <laughs> You know, I wrote that thing. I've, I've never really written much of anything on, on the internet. And I just thought, you know, I've been here for a week. I better put some of my reflections out there. So I, I didn't really think anyone was re really going to look at it. Um, and I and I didn't think it would have really any sort of impact. So it really warms my heart to hear that it was able to affect people in that way. That's really, it's really powerful for me. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I would definitely like to, yeah, meet, meet anyone who I can talk, I like to talk to anyone about all this. So for sure, whenever I, I, I have free time, so. Okay, so 10, 10.30 EDT on Monday. Monday, yeah, yeah. okay, EDT, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, but it's our, 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 therm, our time is, is, is EDT. So that would be 9.30 your time, right? Yeah, right, Joe? Yeah. yeah, that's right. 9.30 on Monday, yeah. Looking for your, your articles. I only for one is. article. So. I got it. Yeah, I, was just, yeah, I just didn't want to interrupt. Oh, here it is. Oh, okay. JPB me too. Sweet. Um, so thank you for exemplifying the point about the power of personal storytelling <laughs> with another person on the call be the person who exemplified it. Uh, thank you so yeah, much for that, Susan. Thank you so much. Brian. I'll, I'll add a little bit to Susan. Um, I'm a, a, an engineer by training, started out in energy engineering, worked for British Columbia Hydro when they were starting demand side management programs um, inspired by um, 
uh, the work of the Rocky Mountain Institute and Amy Lovins. The, the local work here, we're, we're taking the big picture approach. We want to do something meaningful that's going to hopefully have a difference. Um, what do you do when the existing systems are what they are? What do you do when we're in the situ situation we are with climate change and all, all that's baked in already? Um, you can go in um, building relationships. You can go in um, building neighborhood networks. You can go in um, with neighborhood decarbonization initiatives, but ultimately is that enough? Um, so trying to, to bring the bigger picture and the bioregional approach is, is, is really appealing. And we started researching how you would define the local bioregion. And we actually found a, a report that was done in 1992, 20 years ago today, that, that talked about- ago. Oh my God, 30 years ago. That's true. Um, <laughs> wow. the, uh, yeah. that, that talked about regenerating the Toronto bioregion. And that just floored me. And it was written by um, a former mayor of, I think he was mayor of Toronto either just before or just after that report. So we're gonna go back and talk to, to him um, and see his, get his thoughts 30 years later where we are and how we can use a bioregional approach um, in the local work to get people to look at things from a big perspective that we, it's not just about decarbonizing the existing system, it's about relationship building, it's about um, connecting deeply, reconnecting and, and, and reestablishing our relationship with the natural world, uh, weaving in indigenous worldviews and knowledge, um, using the intergenerational dynamic, fostering that dynamic for change, and, and where can we take this uh, deeper and more meaningful. So that's that's the a lot of a lot of the the talks that you've given and and as I said last week, the photographs that you shared from the work you're doing, the plants and the insects and bringing the water back really resonates. So thank you for that. And that's that's where we're at. And so as as we evolve, what we're doing here. We're, we're actively looking for making more of those connections and, and where, where that can lead to. Mm. Thank you, Brian. Is there anyone who'd like to go next? Including here. I guess I could follow up on that. Okay. Let's start over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I guess my own story, I, I, yeah, I don't know, begins, um, I guess I've, I've always just been very interested in uh, just a lot of things and uh, just thinking about the world and seeing the ways slowly over time how there's just so many uh, coalescing problems and many, many, you know, s supposed solutions for those things. And I've looked, I've, I've been looking for many years, I'm young, but I, but Doing a lot of uh, searching, you know, in uh, politics, religion, philosophy, these sorts of things. Um, uh, just really a, a lot of different stuff. And there's definitely, you know, uh, part solutions, part things here and there that were really helpful. Um, but I, I eventually, I, through all this searching, I came across uh, some of Joe's interviews. Um, and, you know, I'm listening to a few of them. I'm like, this guy seems to kind of have a a different approach, much more comprehensive, um, really, really, and, and speaking from the heart that I just, I didn't really see that in other places. A lot of it's very technical, 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 and technical, kind of technocratic, and just, okay, let's, how do we, one, two, three, solve these problems. So I, that really appealed to me, and then I saw he was, uh, you know, in a Twitter, he mentioned uh, a learning journey, and I, starting up in January of this year, so I, you know, I figured I might as well just check it out, and I wasn't, Really expecting a whole lot, you know. I was expecting I'd learn learn a good deal, and that would be kind of go on my way, and it'd be another kind of interesting sort of you know another interesting way way stop in my whole like intellectual journey or whatever. Um, but yeah, as a, the first couple of weeks there, and uh, I noticed that the the community within Earth Regenerators was just really like nothing I'd ever encountered before, 
um, it, it's hard to really put into words, but it's just like the warmth and the openness and the authenticity of, of all the participants were really, I, I was caught off with guard by that. And I, I wasn't really expecting that. And, then, and that's what made me stick around because I, you know, began to see the ways in which human beings could relate differently than what I had, you know, thought was really even possible, at least, you know, in, in the current paradigm here. So the, I went on the next learning journey after that. And then I, and I was also going, you know, throughout the Earth Regenerators platform, talking to more people and uh, kind of understanding just slowly moving into all this because it was all it's all and it's still all is relatively new to me because it's i wasn't really into the regenerative space permaculture or any sorts of these topics before this um so it's it's all really new to me and there's a lot to learn um but yeah it was the social aspect that made me stay so as i was trying to you know i i was not in the best place uh in my life exactly. And, you know, I was, I, there was a moment for me to kind of move on from these sorts of things to sort of reset and regather. And so I decided to come to Bar HR to just sort of experience that uh, sort of community in a grounded space, you know, not just on Zoom, but in, in reality, and then seeing how that might change me or change my perspectives and things like that. And uh, being here for a little over two weeks now, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I am, legitimately surprised how much I've had time to reflect and think about and, and, and ground, ground myself more into myself. Um, you know, this is really, was not easy in, in, the, in the place I was at. And uh, it, it's really, I mean, because Bar HR is called a, pla a place of rest is what I've heard. And, and it, it really, it really has been for me and like nowhere else I, I've been to. And, and part of that is the 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 town the, the local community here it's uh, the 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 nature the environment here and, and it's the people here the earth regenerators that I've been able to talk to it's really fantastic to just meet all these wonderful people a handful of them here in this space and have daily conversations and I that's that's really just been like nothing I've I've had before because I've you know in, throughout my relatively young life here you know I I've I've had a difficulty you know, making any sort of real relationships or, or, or any sort of real sort of uh, friendships, to be honest. And it's, it's been very lonely and isolating um, to go through that. And it's affected me in my own understanding myself, you know, in ways that I, 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 I didn't, you know, I, I wouldn't think of. So trying to reground myself back into like a human community, human connection has been really just uh, priceless. So all these things are kind of been on my mind and, 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 and being here and going through earth regenerators has really just, yeah, it, it has greatly affected me in, in, in so many ways. Mm. Tyler, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Joe. I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> um, and I think one thing to just briefly say about Tyler and this, and this, this way that I think a lot of people are is we have such a fucked up way of raising children and educating them that anyone who's a little sensitive or a little weird or a little ugly or a little awkward or whatever the norms are that makes them bullied or picked on or just feel outside, um, you know, like basically, basically all of the fans of David Bowie, you know, where he gathered the misfits, you sort of, for those in the older generation, you all know what I'm talking about. Um, to have someone who actually spoke to you who was cool for not being cool in the accepted way. And um, so by telling our stories like this, it's really a big deal to be cool in a way that's not the accepted way to be cool. Um, so just wanted to name that. Finding your tribe, if I can yeah. use that word. Finding your tribe is a big, pe big piece as Benji sort of popularized the phrase finding the others in Earth Regenerators and it's been, it's been fundamental. Um, is there anyone else who would like to go and share their story next? I think I might try. Yeah, uh, jump on in. The floor is open. I, I had to put my phone down because uh, I feel like there's some nonverbal communication that might want to come out. Uh, is the wind okay? It's a little breezy. Can you hear me okay? It's good. Okay, well, this is, this is my bio parque. Um, <laughs> I'm currently in Westminster, Colorado. Uh, right in front of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Boulder, Colorado is just, just north of me. Um, 
Tyler, I really appreciate you sharing. Um, I, I opened up the link that was posted in the Zoom chat and then I realized that I had read your story. Um, and I, I think it was one of the, the, the more resonant kind of accounts of, of a day in Barichara um, that, that I remember reading. So um, I'm not sure how this story is going to come out. Um, I, I think for every for all of us, this is kind of uh, new. Um, personally, uh, to be vulnerable, um, I am still learning how to kind of express myself. Um, I would say uh, I haven't done it a lot, like kind of like Tyler said. Um, I, I am wary. Uh, there's there's fear that 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 is I guess just very real for me about sharing publicly, like on Twitter. Um, but I, I feel close to this community, and I realize that it's being recorded. But I think I'm, I'm just okay with that. Um, but I guess where to begin? Um, I, I kind of feel uh, that, like, like was just shared, um, that I I'm not an outsider, but I grew up homeschooled um, up until high school, um, and for me, learning and education was was much more kind of experiential um, and not so heavily um, influenced by by just like rote, rote knowledge um, but it was actually kind of the marriage of of like experience and knowledge and, and all of the other things that really uh, allows you to learn and understand um, I think having that having that uh, understanding that growing up um, I, that kind of put me on a path throughout my career and throughout my, I, I would say, vocational life instead of kind of career life, um, that it requires us to, to uh, understand the multiple ways um, that uh, we engage and experience life. I think, um, I think I've already made this point, but but the university system <laughs> exists in such a way to to um, I would say reinforce reinforce knowledge, um, maybe over experience. And when I started my career um, in technology. I, I I was fortunate enough to to kind of grow up uh, having access to technology, um, and. That led me to a path working in finance. Um, I don't really know how I ended up how I ended up there. I, I was I worked in in the banking industry, um, and I spent about five years, um, the beginning of my career, um, from from pre undergraduate to to post graduate school, um, helping 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 a bank, um, and at the time, I, I felt fulfilled in my work. Um, I, I had the ability to to both learn and, and, and kind of experience. Um, and I, I got to go to school while I was working. And, and I think for me, that was very valuable. But there came a time about three years into the job where I, I started to, um, uh, it, it, was, it was actually a part of my MBA program. Um, I was looking at, at finance kind of as a practice um, and, and more specifically peer-to-peer -peer finance, which, which is, uh, kind of a, the, an abstract conceptual idea of what does kind of finance and economics look like um, when we can do it together um, and not really have big banks, big um, controlling institutions kind of uh, acting as a, um, depending on who you talk to, it's a spectrum. Uh, one side is kind of like just rent seeking. Uh, the other side is, 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 is maybe a little darker uh, exploitation like. Um, but for me, there was really this internal, um, I would say kind of not just a cognitive shift, but it was like a, a, an experience shift is like, we have an, um, an economic system and I relate to an economy um, kind of uh, in, in, from the perspective of language, where if you if you go back to the roots of economy, it's 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 representative of like a house, the oik, like oikos, um, and and to me that that's a pretty 
interesting way to perceive an economy if we recognize it as kind of a, a collective house that spans place that 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 bridges kind of border um but we have an economic system that is so heavily focused on on, on finance and so heavily focused on money um that um we've lost largely like uh, our, our 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 not just I would say this is not necessarily true at the local scale, which is, which is why I remain hopeful. I'm not, I'm not fully bought into kind of a, a collapse mindset, but I, I think we still recognize forms of value that may not be perceived in a banking institution. A bank, a bank um, maybe not until recently, uh, can understand like soil quality and its relationship to like our economy um, and, and, and more, more like, at the community level, how, how relationships actually um, enable us to to show up fully um, and, and and be what I think an economy wants you to be is like an, a, a productive member of society. But um, for me personally, uh, and, and I realize we're probably coming up on time here. Um, for me personally, I, I had this shift and the, and the shift was um, an understanding that there are uh, kind of, there's a plurality of value. Um, money is one dimension of value, and it's and it's kind of the unfortunate uh, just period that we live in that we look at like things like GDP as a measure of, of 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 wealth, and and not like relationships and ecological health and culture and art and and more uh, uh, exchange that's more reflective of like sharing instead of instead of transactions. So. Um, I, I decided to leave the bank. Um, there was personal kind of transformation that was a, that was a part of that, and um, the path that I, I I kind of stepped into was exploring how could technology um, be used, um, and more specifically, kind of in in the in the Web three space, how could this system um, called a, a called a distributed ledger, which which uh, we also know as the blockchain. Um, be used to recognize, appreciate, and and protect the other forms of value um, that are not dependent on money um, in such a way where we can kind of release the dominance of, of, of cash over, over kind of our lives and, and um, uh, I would say even maybe I don't use the word trauma a lot, but like step into a, a place where we can we can actually start to have conversations about about money. We don't. I grew up in a mis, midwestern kind of conservative uh, Protestant household, and you didn't talk about money. You didn't talk about uh, religion except for in a family unit, and you and you don't talk about uh, politics. And and I found that that's actually largely um, over the past fifteen years as I've grown into adulthood, that's largely been damaging because we now have no way to relate to each other. Um, um, we do have ways to relate to each other, but, but they're, they're kind of, I would say repressed. And so um, I think money is, is really a, a theme um, here and, and it's reframing the power that, that, that money has um, over, over lives. And, and I, I would say I've spent the past four and a half years since I left the bank really working to find a space that isn't dominated by money and that and that really appreciates relationship that appreciates care for for um human lives like our our, our, our souls and that appreciates earth and and um earth's recognition as as as, as a as a mother um because uh, in an economy where we can care for seven generations or more, we, we have to really embody a recognition that, that like Earth is like a lifeline for us. So I'm going to leave it here. Um, but Earth Regenerators has been a super special place for me over the past four months. Um, and, and I'm just really grateful for um, everyone here and, and the relationships I've been able to build. It's a really a unique place. Um, and and the magical thing is it's over it's, it's virtual for now i haven't been able to get to bari chara and i'm excited to get there when i do um but i i there's no foreseeable kind of time in the future that i that i'm going to be able to go but um thank you for letting me share and yeah i will 
pass it back to the group. Well, I know some of us need to go for another meeting that starts in a few minutes. In four minutes is the ER fund governance group. Um, and so this might actually be a good time for us to stop and just hold what this experience has been like. For those of us who didn't share our story, what does it feel? No, I'm not asking you to answer this. It's like reflect on this. What does it feel like to hear other people tell their story? Like for example, when someone, like when Todd said, I'm not sure if I, I don't know how to tell my story. I'm a little embarrassed, a little nervous. Do you feel that when you think, when you hear someone tell their story? And does that make you feel less about the other person? Because my experience is I feel love and care for someone who's being vulnerable. And so there's something about the sort of the hidden underbelly of power <laughs> um, in telling our stories that we don't realize how strong our stories can be. Like guessing Tyler didn't expect people to be celebrating his, his writing. Um, we don't know how powerful our story is until we tell it. And on the receiving yeah. end, the rest of us who are listening, our power is to create a safe space for that. And that feels really good. Too. Yeah. Uh, did, did any did, did you just was that, that was that her just to say that those of us, my experience of listening is that I feel empowered that I have the capacity to create a safe space that allows someone like Tyler or someone like Todd to feel like okay this is scary but I'm with people who will hold me and will and and will make this safe so that I can do this and um you know and, and over time the more you tell the story the clearer it becomes. It's kind of, I think of it like those old fashioned Polaroids, you know, um, it starts out, it's kind of like, oh, well, it's just a gray mass. But then after a while, and that was the beauty of campfires in the beginning, is I would, because I didn't know what my story was either. It wasn't until I started telling it and hearing myself say things that it started to become clearer and clearer and clearer to the point where I could write it, but I could not have done that without the people who created the safe space to allow me to do that. So it, it, it's definitely, both parts are really key to this. Mm -hmm. um, some of you have seen the webinar I gave um, called Pro-Socialist Regenerative Finance. Um, if you haven't, I'm posting all of those webinars from Crowdcast and putting them on YouTube. And I posted that specific one yesterday. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find it near the top. And what I basically said was a regenerative finance system is the flow of value in a living system and a pro-social group is a living system, QED. You know, I've proven what I set out to prove. A regenerative finance system is a pro-social group having a conversation. And that means we practice regenerative finance by being in this way of relating to each other, exactly the way Rachel just said. And so now, as we call this meeting to a close, let's reflect on what fundraising is really going to mean. Fundraising is going to be revealing the existing value between us by connecting in meaningful relationship, revealing the value that already exists. We don't have to look for it. It will show up. I didn't look for Brian and Susan. They showed up with a lot more than $2,000, I must say. And so... When we show up in meaningful relationship, none of us know the abundance that's gonna appear because it's more than we can imagine. And that's why this kind of fundraising, in quotes, is gonna feel so different. And so, so just take this and reflect on it. And my invitation to you is sometime in the next week, try to find an opportunity to tell someone your personal story. Tell someone your story. It can be your partner. It can be an old friend. It can be your dog sitting on the couch, but practice telling it. And you'll thank me for it later, I promise. So thank you everyone. I feel like this is a very valuable way of spending an hour learning to fund fundraise for Bari Chara. If we tell our stories, we're gonna change the world. So thank you everyone. And now goodbye. And thank talk you all.